Meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. We have seven nominees on the agenda today, and each has been listed for the first time and will be held over. They are Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, nominated to be the Associate Justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, <clears throat> Judge Stephanie Davis, nominated to the Sixth Circuit, Ariana Freeman, nominated to the Third Circuit, Robert Huey, nominated to the Southern District of California, Evelyn Padden, nominated to the District of New Jersey, Jennifer Reardon, nominated to the Southern District of New York, and Vanessa Avery, nominated to be U.S. Attorney for the District of Connecticut. Last week, the committee spent more than 30 hours over four days considering Judge Jackson's nomination. I described it as a trial by ordeal for the nominee, and I believe it was nothing less. Uh, I came away personally very impressed. It's clear why she's been it's clear why she has been reported out of this committee three times before with bipartisan support. We saw her qualifications and broad legal experience, her devotion to her family, her country, and the rule of law. We saw her commitment to liberty, justice, and the Constitution, the Constitution that should work for all Americans. And then there is the issue of temperament. The majority of members on both sides, the majority, were fair and respectful. Unfortunately, in the words of one Republican member of the committee, there were examples of a word I had not heard before, quote, jackassery, close quote, and playing to the social media and the cameras. But in the face of gross distortions of her record and repeated false attacks on her motives, Judge Jackson showed rock steady grace and poise. She was, in short, a model for judicial temperament, a virtue which all of us in public life should aspire to. I want to briefly address two or three of the claims made by her opposition last week. First, a number of my Republican colleagues suggested she just doesn't have a judicial philosophy. Well, respectfully, that's just not true. But to find that philosophy, it's not going to be a declaration of a label. You have to take the time to read any or all of the 578 written opinions which she'd issued and 12,000 pages of committee testimony before the Sentencing Committee. My Republican colleagues should keep in mind that they have supported many of President Trump's nominees who also declined labels when it came to judicial philosophies. Judge Jackson's philosophy may not be described by a catchword, but it reflects the real proper role of a judge in America. Listen to the parties, approach each case without favoritism, set aside your personal view, apply the law to the facts. Second, some Republicans suggested that Judge Jackson is just not acceptable in any way because she won't weigh in on the issue of packing the court. Senator McConnell said exactly that on the floor last Thursday. Came to the floor and said, I just can't consider her. She, the first thing he said, she wouldn't answer that question. I would recommend that Senator McConnell go back and take a look at the record on Amy Coney Barrett, the justice on the Supreme Court. She was asked the same question. She said, I will not opine on that matter virtually the same answer that's been given by Judge Jackson. Finally, multiple Republicans accused her of being soft on crime. This baseless charge took multiple forms, none more vile than the outright falsehood that she let child pornography offenders off the hook. As an independent facts checker and former federal judge have attested, Judge Jackson's record is well within the mainstream of 70 to 80 percent of federal court judges. Even a conservative formal federal prosecutor in the National Review dismissed many of the attacks as, quote, meritless to the point of demagoguery. Some members of this committee used the entirety of their question time, all 50 minutes, to focus exclusively on child pornography cases. Now, this may play well to the QAnon crowd and the fringe conspiracy theories who helped drive the insurrection on January 6, 2021, but the American public sees it for what it is. I want to make a point, though, of saying clearly and unequivocally, not all committee Republicans treated Judge Jackson unfairly. The majority, starting with the ranking member, the majority of Republicans approached this hearing as one would only expect, asking tough but fair questions of the nominee to the highest court in the land. I thank the members on the Republican side as well as the Democratic side for being constructive and respectful for the most part and for showing the American people that there can still be decency at the highest levels of our government. I hope all senators from both sides of the aisle can learn from the good example of the senators who were fair. 
Given that we, all that we heard, it's no surprise that Judge Jackson enjoys broad and deep support, including from law enforcement, organizations, conservative lawyers, and judges. These voices across the political and ideological spectrum know that, as we know, Judge Jackson embodies all the qualities one expects to be appointed to the highest court in the land. I will speak uh, more on Judge Jackson, of course, next week markup when we uh, hopefully vote her out of the committee. But in the meantime, I want to quote with a statement from her opening statement, which struck me. She referred to the first African-American woman to serve as a federal judge, Judge Constance Baker Motley. Judge Jackson said, and I quote, like Judge Motley, I've dedicated my career to ensuring that the words engraved on the front of the Supreme Court building, equal justice under the law, are a reality and not just an ideal. I can think of no more important quality in the Supreme Court nomination than the dedication to equal justice. Judge Jackson shows precisely why such definition fits her, and I hope that it is demonstrated in the committee's meeting next week. I now turn to Ranking Member Grassley for his remarks. Uh, I join in the request to hold over the nominees for one week. I'll have specific things to say about the nomination of Judge Jackson at that meeting a week from today. Uh, I want to just uh, speak a little bit about process. Uh, Democrat, Democrats have uh, taken to repeatedly mentioning uh, that Judge Jackson has been confirmed by the Senate three times, two of which were non-controversial, using votes for positions like the U.S. Sentencing Commission is uh, going to make it much harder to confirm anyone to those positions. It encourages senators to apply the same standard used for evaluating Supreme Court nominations uh, to every single position. If Democrats had applied the approach that they want Republicans to use now, that would be one thing. But we know that they haven't. Democrats have voted against nominees who were confirmed unanimously for the circuit court. President Biden did that four times as a United States senator. Ten other Democrats in the Senate now have done the same thing for more than one nominee. Hopefully, then, uh, they will think hard before continuing down that road. Unfortunately, Judge Jackson's record is incomplete. That's because information has been withheld. We're missing all of Judge Jackson's non-public sentencing commission documents. The Obama White House held back 48,000 pages of documents. We also received an unconfirmed chart of probation sentencing for 14 cases from Judge Jackson and the White House that the Democrats have attempted to use to uh, uh, defend her record. And as far as the further inquiries go about how the nominee handled child exploitation cases, we're looking at a record. That's what we're supposed to do, it appears the White House want to hide that record. So with so much information withheld, we've examined her record. There were a lot of questions about Judge Jackson's judicial philosophy. She says her philosophy is based on her cases. That's more of a case of making a case for uh, judicial um, uh, process than it is judicial philosophy. Uh, one senator on the other side noted that he didn't think that he'd ever heard a nominee get so many questions on that topic of judicial philosophy. Apparently, it's been conveniently forgotten by the other side that it was their current leader, Senator Schumer, who first publicly made judicial philosophy a primary reason for opposing nominees, and that's way back two decades ago. That's when the Democrats filibustered the first black female to the D.C. Circuit, and that was Janice Rogers Brown, who would have been maybe the first female black Supreme Court nominee if Democrats hadn't so vehemently opposed her. As I said, I'll have more to say on that subject 
once I've finished reviewing her record. I yield. <clears throat> We're going to reconvene at 10 a.m. next Monday, April 4th, to vote on Judge Jackson's nomination and those other nominees listed today's agenda. In the meantime, uh, we will continue to uh, uh, pursue other nominations before this committee. Does anyone seek recognition? Only when the business of the committee is adjourned. I don't want to keep people here unnecessarily. Well, with that, the meeting stands adjourned. Well. Then the Senate Judiciary Committee reconvenes. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to um, offer a personal reflection um, based on the testimony of Ms. McCullen on the last day of the hearing, who seemed like an extremely nice person and spoke about the engagement of um, anti-abortion uh, protesters outside New England clinics as um, an expression of compassion and of love. And I have no doubt that Ms. McCullen uh, behaved that way. <clears throat> but the law in question that was the subject of the brief that made this topic relevant to the hearing was passed in Massachusetts in 2000. And before that, there had been quite a history outside of clinics in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. In fact, my recollection is that there were activists going back and forth between Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And the atmosphere outside of Rhode Island's Planned Parenthood clinic on Point Street in Providence uh, became so hostile and so intimidating that they had to recruit volunteers to be escorts through the crowd to get people safely to the facility. You, there was a little bit of a zone, of, of a, like a stand-back zone, and they would try to get people to drive in and drop pe the people off in the stand-back zone. But if they couldn't do that, if they had to park someplace and then come through the protesters, they had um, constantly had to have security volunteers. And they wore pink <laughs> sweatshirts or T-shirts. And that way, the person could know that this was a friendly security person approaching them to help them get through the crowd. So it had gotten to be pretty hostile, pretty intimidating. Um, it was a regular concern. Um, and it got really bad. I was US attorney at the time. Um, I got word that a, a man had gone into a clinic in Massachusetts, I think it was in Brookline, and he'd shot a few people. He'd killed the receptionist with a rifle from you know, just mere feet away. And then we got the word that there had been a second shooting at another clinic, also in Massachusetts. Um, and they had not apprehended the shooter. He was at large still. So I called up the marshal, wonderful guy named Jack Layden, and I said, Marshal, you got to get some people out in front of Planned Parenthood in Providence just to make sure that we're not next in this person's murderous series of uh, encounters with clinics. And he said, well, I don't know if we can do that. We don't kind of do that. But I said, well, you can protect me, right? And he said, yeah, definitely. We can get a team over there. I said, all right, meet you there. And so we went straight to the clinic. And I remember it was a December day, and it was cold. And we just stood outside waiting until things had calmed down enough. People came in who, who ran the clinic, and they the Providence police end up came and they par parked a cruiser outside and there was finally enough security that the marshal, myself, the marshal's people and the FBI could all go back to our offices. And as it turned out, the shooter had driven right by and had been 95 is only, you know, a couple hundred yards away from this clinic because we, we know he went by because he was arrested in Virginia the following day and 95 is the path down. 
I have no reason to believe he got off 95 or actually went by this facility, but he was certainly close that day. That was the environment that predated this 2000 law. Hectoring, intimidation, threats outside of the clinics, clinics having to recruit volunteers to identify themselves and help women come through the crowd safely, special arrangements for drop-off within the cordon area, and then ultimately um, the murders and the shootings that took place that awful day. So there's a little bit more to the story of what led to the Massachusetts law than what the testimony of Ms. McCullen would have led one to believe. And because I was personally involved in it to that extent and obviously worked with Planned Parenthood immediately afterwards to make sure that their security stayed in place for a while, I just wanted to share that personal recollection because it's very much at odds with the um, atmosphere of compassion and love that Ms. McCullen described. This was an atmosphere of gunshots, terror, screaming, murder. It was a grim time, and that was pre the 2000 law that was the subject of her brief. So thank you for allowing me to relate that. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Blumenthal? Yeah, I might just add a footnote to uh, Senator Whitehouse's very important comments, which is that at the time of Judge Jackson's brief, I organized a brief on behalf of the attorneys general, state attorneys general. I was attorney general of Connecticut at the time. And this issue really had nationwide import. Her involvement and her brief, I think, elevated the discussion and elucidated important legal and factual issues. And uh, I know at the time we were extremely grateful for the involvement of a broad array of organizations in that litigation. The attorneys general and my office was involved because we were on the front lines in Connecticut of enforcing that federal statute. It was a federal statute, but we were involved in enforcement. Thank you, Senator. Anyone Senator, else? Senator Klobuchar. As we all had similar um, moments at that time, and I just wanted to add my mind was that we had a bombing of a, a clinic uh, in our area, and I still remember getting a box in the mail, and it was from someone I knew, so we opened it up, and this private citizen had sent me a bulletproof vest because I kept going to all of the events around the clinics to protect them and stand up, and I just want to reiterate what uh, Senator Whitehouse so beautifully said uh, that was that time. Thank you. Nor the further for the business to come before the Judiciary Committee, we're going to really stand adjourned.